Christmas. Thank you to our worship team for kicking off our Christmas morning worship service in that way. Good to have you here worshiping with us at Riverview Baptist this morning. Why don't you just take a moment, stand up and wish someone next to you a Merry Christmas as we begin our worship today. grabbed a bulletin on your way into the sanctuary today. All kinds of information for you about our church in there. Maybe this is your first time at Riverview. You're in town for the holidays or something. Take a look at this bulletin and find out more about our church or go to riverviewbaptist.net and uh, find out whatever information you'd like to know there as well. There's also a blue slip of paper in that bulletin. If you wouldn't mind, take that out. Put your name and some information about yourself on there. Pop that in the basket outside the sanctuary after the service. We'd be happy to make a contact with you if you are so inclined. Or we, we would also be privileged to be able to pray for you. So if there's something we can pray about for you, note that on that blue slip. And we will be faithful to pray for you um, this week. 
That's really all I have in the way of announcements this morning. Good to have you here worshiping on this Christmas Sunday. Also want to invite you back next Sunday on New Year's Day as we start the new year, 2023, in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. Why don't we begin our service this morning with a word of prayer. Our great God of love, there is light in our lives this morning because of the abundance of your steadfast love. Lord, it's a love that is so vast and deep and real that you became one of us. Lord, may we live within this power of love, and may we share this light with a world where so many dwell in darkness. Bless us this morning to this end, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. In Isaiah 42, we read, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. Would you stand as we sing this morning? I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. I thought how as the day had come, the Isaiah 9 verse 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Joy. Good, good, good. 
John 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God.
we want to meet with God in prayer as we worship him. And I invite you to think back just to those verses Carrie just read a moment ago from John 3. We're going to be looking at those verses here in a little more detail in just a couple of minutes. But we really want to focus on Jesus coming as the light and, and shining that light into the world, exposing darkness, exposing sin, also showing us the truth, the truth about God, the truth about ourselves and the way to be reconciled to him. Jesus is the light. And so this morning we want to meet with God together in prayer. Let's go to God and pray right now. Our Father God, you are the source of all good. Lord, what shall we give to you for the gift of gifts that you have given? Your own Son. He is our Redeemer. His self-emptying is incomprehensible. His infinity of love is beyond the grasp of our hearts. Herein, Lord, is the wonder of Christmas, that he came below to raise us above, that he was born like us, that we might become like him. Herein is love, that when we could not rise to him, he drew near to us on wings of grace to raise us to himself. Herein is power, that when God and man were infinitely apart, he united them through himself. Herein is wisdom, that when we were undone with no will to return to him and no intellect to devise recovery, he came, God incarnate, to save to the uttermost as a man to die my death, to shed satisfying blood on my behalf, to work out a perfect righteousness for me. Lord, take us in spirit this morning to the watchful shepherds and enlarge our minds let us hear good tidings of great joy, and in hearing may we believe, rejoice, praise, and adore. Place us with the animals at the manger, to look with them upon the Redeemer's face, and in him let us account ourselves delivered from sin by grace through faith. Lord, give us an undying faith that embraces the Savior this Christmas. Let us each say that he is mine and I am his. In him you have given us so much that heaven could give no more. So Lord, bless us this Christmas with your presence. We ask in the name of your son, Jesus, the one who came to live and die. Amen. Would you stand once more and sing with us as we celebrate the coming of the light of the world, her Christ, our King.
Christmas morning. We're going to spend just a few moments focusing on God's Word this morning. If you have your Bible with you and you're so inclined, you can certainly open to John chapter 3. We'll be in those verses this morning that we read earlier in the service, those very familiar verses, John chapter 3. First, as you're turning there, I'd like to ask you, did you get everything on your list this year? All the gifts that you had stored up for others? And did you receive all the gifts that were on your list? Did you get what you want? Maybe you got a gift that you didn't want. Maybe you got a gift that raised your eyebrows. And you said, okay. So, this is where we're going. Whatever you got this Christmas, just keep in mind, the whole reason we give gifts as a tradition at Christmas is to turn our hearts and our attention back to the greatest gift of all, Jesus. That's why the tradition of gift giving exists, to turn our attention to the greatest gift. And so we turn our attention there this morning. And now this Christmas here at Riverview, this Christmas season, we've been focusing on different reasons given by the New Testament authors as to why Jesus came to earth, why this whole business of Christmas is important in the first place. Of course, we all know Jesus came. He, uh, we're familiar with the nativity scene and everything else, but why? What's the purpose for his coming? Why did he come to live a human life? Well, so far this season, we've seen that Jesus came to save sinners. He came to adopt us into his family. He came to be the perfect sacrifice for sin, and he came to show us how to live. And so it's Christmas, and Jesus has come. In this final week of the Christmas season, we turn to the Gospel of John to see what Jesus himself says about why he came. Now, these are very familiar verses. I think uh, John 3.16 is probably the most uh, widely known and well-known verse in the entire Bible across the face of the whole earth. Most, most people, if they only know one verse of the Bible, they know John 3.16, which is a statement about why Jesus came to the earth. But before we get to that verse, I want to look at some of the other verses in this passage. And in fact, in verse 17, Jesus tells us the reason God, excuse me, Jesus tells us a reason why, not why he came. That didn't make any sense. Jesus tells us why, how am I, what am I trying to say here? Jesus tells us something that is not the reason that he came into this world. Look at verse 17. I'll just let Jesus say it instead of me. He says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. So we can mark it down for sure that one of the reasons Jesus you know what I mean, did not come, is he didn't come to condemn the world. That's not why he came, not to condemn the world. You can mark that down. He did not come to kill or to destroy. He did not come to pronounce judgment against the world. So many people, however, see Jesus this way, don't they? It's kind of like a divine buzzkill, right? He's here to take away your fun, or to make you feel guilty or bad or judged. That must be why Jesus came into the world, to make me feel terrible about myself. But Jesus says that's not why he came. He did not come to condemn the world. Now there's a very good reason for that. And the reason is that the world is already condemned. 
Jesus has no need to come into the world to condemn the world because the world is already self-condemned. Look at verse 18. Jesus says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You see, condemnation is the baseline. It's the default setting of the world. Romans chapter 8 tells us that the earth itself is broken and groaning and longing for its redemption. And everyone in the world shares in that brokenness, that sinful problem and separation from God. So you see, condemnation is the default setting. You could say that condemnation was the feature, not the bug. So for Jesus to come into the world to condemn would be redundant. That is not why he came. He did not come to condemn. Now, in one sense, our American Christmas celebration is just that. It's very American. We have Jesus in a manger, and Mary and Joseph look like us, and the shepherds and wise men are all there at the nativity scene and so on. But obviously, the nativity scene is foreign to many parts of the world in which Christianity is not a dominant religion or cultural influence. In fact, the idea of a nativity scene that we all have in our houses probably even this morning is of kind of a foreign concept to a large portion of the world. And sometimes people wonder, how is it fair of God to condemn people who just so happen to be unfortunate to be born in other non-Western, non-Christian cultures? How could God condemn people who have never heard of Jesus? I mean, it's not their fault that they haven't heard, is it? Well, the answer to this objection is that God does not condemn anyone for something they haven't known or haven't heard. Instead, as Jesus says, the world is condemned already. All people have embraced sin as their core identity. All people have turned away from God in their natural state. And so all people are condemned, not because they haven't heard about Jesus, but because of their willful sin and rebellion. This is why the world is condemned. It is not condemned because Jesus came into the world. No. As though if only he hadn't come into the world, well, then everyone would be fine, right? No. The world and everyone in it is condemned already because of their sin. I mean, go ahead and take Jesus out of the picture completely, and the world still stands condemned in its sin. So Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. Well, then why did he come? He says so in the last half of verse 17. In order that the world might be saved through him. You see, the world was already condemned. That's not why Jesus came, to condemn it even more. No, Jesus came into the world as a baby. Why we celebrate Christmas? He came into the world so that the world might be saved through him. Condemnation is the default. Jesus is the remedy. Jesus came into the world because the world was already condemned, and he desired to save the world from its condemnation. Now, I think we need to pause here just a minute to consider the scope of what we're talking about. You see, in these verses, John 16, 3, 16 through 20, Jesus uses the word, the world, a lot, doesn't he? And that has tripped people up over time as they come away thinking that, well, everyone in the world is condemned, so Jesus says that I've come to save the world, so that means that everyone is saved, right? Well, this is what is known as universalism, a theology that posits that all people in human history will be saved through Christ. But that can certain, is certainly not the, clay, the case, as we'll see in just a minute. Because what Jesus means when he says the world is he's speaking of the extent of the world's condemnation and also the extent to which he is able to save. The whole world and everyone in it is already self-condemned. But Jesus is powerful enough and he is willing to save the whole world from its condemnation. 
You see, Jesus is telling us just how lost the world is and also how powerful he is to save. And we see that distinction clearly in verse 18. It says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So clearly Jesus didn't come to save everyone in the world because Jesus himself says, whoever does not believe is condemned already already. There's a clear delineation between the redeemed and those who are condemned. However, those who believe in the name of this only Son of God move from condemnation to deliverance, to redemption. The world is condemned in evil, but Jesus is the remedy. And the way to escape the world's condemnation is to believe in the name of the only Son of God. And the way Jesus goes about saving the world by coming into the world, he says, is by shining light. Look at verse 19. He says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Again, remember that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. Instead, he came into the world to save the world. And the way he does that is by shining a light to expose the world's condemnation and to expose its sin. That is what he means by this whole idea of shining the light. Jesus came to shine a light so that we could see that we are already self-condemned, to show us our sin and to simultaneously show us our need for a savior, to show us a way out of our condemnation. You see, the only way it makes sense to think that you need a savior is if there's something you know you need to be saved from. Think about this for a minute. Imagine someone comes up to you and says, I can see by invisible symptoms that only I know how to tell that you have a very, very deadly disease and if left untreated, you will be dead in just a few short hours. Here, take this pill and you'll be saved. Would you take it? I wouldn't. No, no way. Tell me what's wrong with me. How do I know that there's something wrong with me in order to take this miracle cure? You see, in order for the the remedy, the cure, the treatment to make sense, you must first know the disease. And the same thing is true with our hearts. In order to know that Jesus is a very great Savior, I must first know that I am a very great sinner. In order to know that I need to be saved, I need to know from what I must be saved. You see, in order for the good news to be good, you must first understand the bad news. And Jesus says that you need to be saved from a condemnation that is wired into your DNA. Everything about you has just is infected with sin. And because of that sin, you have not believed in the name of the only Son of God, and so you are condemned. But, he says, the Son of Man came into the world to save the world. Jesus is the remedy. He didn't come to condemn. He came to shine a light on your sin as the problem and a light on himself as the solution. Now, When Jesus comes and shines the light and exposes our condemnation, there are two possible responses when you see that light shining. If you look at verse 20, he says, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You see, there are only two possible responses to when Jesus shines that light into the world. Now, we don't have any cockroaches or or really too many rats in Minnesota, as exemplified this morning. It's just too cold, right? But in other parts of the world, they have pests like that, and you've heard about what happens when you walk into a dark room and you flip on the light. All of the pests scurry away, right? They, They love to be in the dark, but once that light turns on, they run away and hide. And that's one reason, or that's one response to the light that Jesus has come to shine, to run away from it and to hide. 
because you know that the light is going to expose some things about yourself that are unpleasant. It's going to expose the sin that has led to your condemnation. And let's be honest, that's understandable, right? It's not very pleasant to learn hard, bad things about yourself. Nobody likes to see their flaws and failures out in the light. No one, you know, looks in the mirror and says, wow, I look horrible, this is great. No, nobody likes to know those kinds of things about themselves. We like to keep those things hidden away from view, from from everybody else, and certainly from God. But if you're going to find the remedy for your condemnation, you must face the light. You must acknowledge the exposure of the sin that has led to your condemnation. That's one response to when Jesus shines that light. The other response is to when Jesus shines that light to your corruption is to stand there and face it, to take it in, to see the world and yourself in truth. And even though it might be uncomfortable for you to see warts and all in the light of Christ, seeing yourself in truth and seeing the ugliness and sin that resides within you is what is best for you. Because by seeing the depths of your sin, you can and will see your need for the Savior. You see, again, when you understand your sin, when that light shines on your sin and you really see how how detestable and, and ugly your sin is, then the gospel makes sense. Then Christmas makes sense. Jesus came into the world to shine a light on my sin and to be the remedy for that sin. This is why Jesus says that whoever does what is true comes to the light. That's what he says in verse 21. Whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now that doesn't mean that there are just some people who are better than others and so they're a little more true and so when the light shines on them, you know, their balance weighs out a little differently so they look a little better to God. No, everyone is equally self-condemned. But what Jesus means here when he says that whoever does what is true comes to the light, what he means is that they have seen themselves in the light. They have seen their sin exposed. They've seen the truth of their just judgment and punishment and the truth that Jesus is the Savior who can save them from both of those things. For those kinds of people who know that they're sinful and know that Jesus is a very great Savior, for those people, the light is not scary. It shows the truth and the truth that Jesus is the Savior who can save them from all of it. So Jesus says that he has come not to condemn the world, but to save it. And he has come to save the world by shining this light in the darkness of our sin and condemnation. And those who are willing to acknowledge the truth of that light will come to him and be saved. And those who are unwilling to acknowledge that truth and who prefer to hide in shame will not be, and who will not believe, Jesus says, are condemned already. Now, you've probably noticed that we haven't covered that one verse that is so well-known and so popular, verse 16. We'll get to that in a moment. But before we do, let me tell you a little story, a Christmas story. When I was a teenager here in the youth group at Riverview, one Christmas we decided to do a white elephant gift exchange. You're familiar with those, where everybody brings a, a very, you know, a, a very not valuable gift. You know, I think our our limit at the time was $5 or less. You could spend $5 or less on whatever this gift was, bring it, and then we played a little game where kind of like musical chairs, but the, you know, the 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 music would start and everybody would pass the gift to the to the right and you'd keep passing and then all of a sudden you it would switch and then you pass them back to the left. And so you kind of do this for a while and then the music stops and then everybody has one gift in their hands, and whatever they have is is what they get, you know, from somebody. They don't even know who it's from, but everybody has brought this kind of gift, and it could be any kind of gift you wanted it to be. It could be something you went to the store and bought for five dollars or less, which that long ago, five dollars was a a decent amount of money. Or it could be just something you had laying around at home. It could be a gag gift or something like that. 
And I always wanted to, to do something nice. I don't remember what I got in that particular instance or what I, what I bought for somebody else. But it was something I actually went to the store for and bought, you know, something that had some value and some utility to it for someone else. And so the music stops and I'm left there holding my gift. And it's a box. And then everybody opens their gifts, you know, all at the same time to see what they give. And so some people open their gifts and they've got a 12-pack of pop or, or they've got a, a, you know, a bunch of candy bars or something like that or, or maybe a $5 gift card to some store or something like that. And so I open my box and I pull out an almost completely used stick of deodorant. <laughs> That's what I got for my white elephant gift. Now imagine what I was thinking when I got that gift. First, I mean, I was grossed out because it was a used <laughs> stick of deodorant. I was holding something that was, has been in people's armpits, right? Uh, so that was kind of gross. But the second thought I had was that I was really kind of bummed out. I wanted something nice. I wanted something useful. After all, that's what I did when I went out and got my gift. I got somebody something nice. And then third, I was kind of angry. <laughs> I, I got something much less than everyone else got. So it was not a great experience for me, and I think I just ended up throwing it away in the garbage right away. I mean, why wouldn't I? There's no reason to hold on to a used stick of deodorant. But imagine this. Imagine someone gets a used stick of deodorant as a Christmas gift and they absolutely love it. They absolutely adore it. In fact, they sell all they have in order to build a monument to this used up stick of deodorant so it can be safe and secure for the rest of time. Now, obviously, that would be insane. Why would anyone do something like that for a used up stick of deodorant? Why would somebody love something so much that was not useful, that was disgusting, and that was worn out and gross? Why would anybody love something like that? Look at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, Jesus came into a world that was self-condemned. A world that hid from him because they knew that when he shone his light on them, it would expose just how evil they were. And yet God loved that world. And even though it might sound foolish to think about you know, building a monument to a used up stick of deodorant, the condemnation of the world is so much worse than that in orders of magnitude as we can't even comprehend. You know, how foolish it would be, it would seem to, to build a monument to the deodorant. Imagine sending your beloved son, God himself, into a world that hates him and that runs away from him at every opportunity. How much must God love the world? And so Jesus came into that world as a baby and to live as a man, ultimately, as we sang this morning, to go to the cross, to die for that condemned world so that all who would trust in him, who would believe in him, would not be condemned, would not perish, but would have eternal life. That's the story of Christmas. Jesus comes into the world, born as a baby, lives as a man, dies as a criminal. He comes into a world and does those things, a world that is condemned, but he comes to save them. And so Jesus came at Christmas as a baby to live as a man, die as a criminal, because he loves you. And God so loves you that he sent his one and only son that you might believe in him and not perish, but have eternal life. We've been asking this question all Christmas season, why 
did Jesus come? That's why, folks. And there are numerous reasons given in the Old Testament, but if you, and you can go and study each and every one of those reasons that the New Testament authors note and that Jesus himself says throughout the Gospels of why he came, when you synthesize all of those reasons and bring them all together, they're pointing you at that one answer. He came because he loves you and he wants to die for you. And now if Jesus has shined his light on you this Christmas and has exposed that sin that has led to your condemnation, I want to encourage you, don't run away from the light. Instead, stand in it and see yourself for who you truly are, a very great sinner. And then see Jesus for who he really is, a very great Savior who will take you from that sinning position to sanctified, to saved. Come to Jesus. That's why he came. That's why we're celebrating Christmas today, right now. That's the whole point, folks. A very great Savior came to a self-condemned world to rescue them. Praise the Lord. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we stand in awe before you of your willingness to come and sacrifice yourself, to die a sinner's death on behalf of those who would put their trust in you. Lord Jesus, we praise you, and we could stay here and praise you for the next 10,000 years, and it still wouldn't even be close to enough for what you have done. Lord, I ask that you would create a spiritual hunger in people here this morning that can only be filled by your spirit and the truth of your word. Lord, I ask that you would open blind eyes to be sensitive to the light of your truth shining in and among them, Lord, that you would expose sin and that your spirit would quicken hearts to come and heed the call to salvation, to believe the gospel. Lord Jesus, may you be honored and glorified this Christmas, by our faith, by our trust, by our love. And Lord, now as you bless the rest of this day, as we go and we gather with family and friends to rejoice with one another that you have come. Lord, let us not forget why you have come, because you love the world and you came to rescue it. Lord, bless us this Christmas. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we sing to our God who is worthy of all praise and who has revealed his love for us in Christ.
now, you, now may you be filled with the wonder of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the Magi, and the peace of the Christ child. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.